Okay, uh, welcome. I guess we are live now to our third session of today uh, for practical visualization. I'm Andre Vashk, your session chair of today, and uh, I was kindly reminded to tell you that you should join our Discord for questions to our speakers. Um, our first speaker, uh, Shivam Akrabal, I guess I haven't butchered your name too much, uh, submitted a video about his talk um, due to some technical difficulties. Um, he will present a visualization of user sessions for virtual reality and mixed reality scenarios. And I guess we will start with this video today on the YouTube stream, and we will see you afterwards for the Q&A with the speaker. Hello. Welcome to the presentation of our recent work titled A Design and Application Space for Visualizing User Sessions of Virtual and Mixed Reality Environments. My name is Shivam and I will give the presentation on behalf of my colleagues Jonas, Stefan and Fabian. With the advance and spread of the technology, virtual and mixed reality systems gain more and more complexity. A typical session in virtual and mixed reality environments consists of several entities, which can be users and objects. Both of them can be either virtual or real. Next, the session consists of several events such as interactions between entities. Finally, the data recorded from these sessions has spatial and temporal properties. Developers of virtual and mixed reality applications and researchers in human-computer interaction must analyze this complex data to draw conclusions. Hence, a challenging question arises. How to analyze the user sessions of virtual and mixed reality environments? The answer, using visualizations. Visualizations can help in the inspection of session data to gain useful insights. As first examples, Chitaro and others in 2006 while Draken and others in 2011 used visualizations to provide insights about navigation behavior of players in virtual game worlds. A holistic understanding of how to tackle multiple aspects of the data of such sessions is still missing. However, there are visualization approaches for various related domains that can provide inspiration. To find suitable visualizations for analyzing sessions, we explored related approaches of neighboring fields. These fields are interactions, eye tracking, physical motion, and stories. These neighboring fields share similarity with the targeted application with respect to visualizing similar types of data. We follow a qualitative sampling approach, selecting a diverse set of examples with the goal of covering a broad range of approaches, but not of quantifying how frequently the discussed solutions appear in the literature. We systematically explored the visualizations from the related areas and assigned certain keywords. The keywords reflected concepts, for example, time, event icon, summary that are useful for visual analysis of data recorded from mixed reality user sessions. Based on similarity of data property, we grouped the keywords. As a result of the grouping, we generated seven categories. These categories are Entity identifiers, Event identifiers, Entity timeline, Event timeline, Event density field, Project review, and Scene view. These categories form the building blocks of our design and application space for visualizing user sessions of virtual and mixed reality environments. Please note that in contrast to immersive analytics, the visualizations discussed in this work are not necessarily part of the mixed reality scene, but are used in a separate analysis interface. Entity identifiers are those visual design elements that represent a user or an object in the environment. Usually, interactive objects in the environments are considered as entities. To uniquely identify an entity, the identifiers usually use text, icons, colors, and position. The entity identifiers are often used in combination with entity timeline, trajectory view, and scene view. 
Next category is event identifiers. These are used to uniquely identify each event that occurred in the session. Similar to entity identifiers, they also use text, icon, colors, and position encodings. In addition, they also use shape to identify an event. They are often used in combination with entity timeline, trajectory view, and event timeline. Moving on to entity timeline. An entity has features that change over time, such as associated events and interactions with other entities. The timeline represents these temporal changes in features of each entity. The timeline contains a set of entities and commonly shows time on a horizontal axis. Event timeline also shows temporal changes, but it represents the sequence of a set of events rather than entities themselves. The timeline can have a linear or a non-linear layout. The time span of events is commonly encoded by the size or area of the glyphs in the timeline. Next is event density field. The visual elements in this category shows the density of events or event sets spread across time. It is commonly visualized through histograms, heat maps, size or area of glyphs, and 3D surfaces. The visualizations of this category can be augmented to highlight additional attributes. For example, representing event density on the map juxtaposed with another view showing linked entities. The trajectory view category includes visualizations that show movement of entities across time. It is usually shown via 3D visualization or a 2D projection of movements. The visualizations can also be augmented, for example, to provide context of the environment. The final category, Scene View, includes visualizations that shows scenes of the session along time. It can include scenes from both real and virtual worlds. The details in the visualization can be abstracted and depends on the data analysis task. Common techniques used in these visualizations include using multiple images as keyframes, animations, and recorded videos. Okay, now we have the recorded sessions which can be visualized for further analysis using the design elements from proposed categories. A question arises, in which scenarios are these visualization categories useful and how to use them? To answer the question, we complement the design space with a description of its applications and focus on two scenarios. First application scenario is debugging. Application developers of virtual and mixed reality environments face several challenges. They often need to work with multiple devices and hence need to tune them for better precision. They also need to debug the environment design, build accurate interactions, and address usability issues. Second application scenario is evaluation. Human-computer interaction researchers often conduct user studies to evaluate a newly proposed interaction in virtual and mixed reality environment or test other hypotheses. To do so, the researchers need to infer behavior of users, including the complex movements and interactions. The researchers also need to compare user behaviors and perform qualitative analysis of user studies. The two scenarios were also highlighted in recent works of Ashari and others in their work published in CHI 2020. Visualizations have been found effective to address some of the challenges before. We propose that the categories in design space can be used in different combinations to address the challenge of two scenarios. Next, we present one application example and demonstrate how to use the design space in the evaluation application scenario. In this example, two participants collaborate in one shared virtual environment. The participants sit in different rooms, location 1 and location 2. However, in the virtual environment, they appear to be sitting at one table facing each other. Voice is recorded and streamed to the respective other location so that the participants can hear each other. Both participants have tiles on their desks. The positions and orientations of the tiles are tracked optically 
and synchronized with the virtual environment. Hence, every user can see a virtual representation of the tiles of the other user. The objective of the collaboration scenario is to arrange all the tiles according to a plan each collaborator has only a part of. The participants must collaborate to complete the puzzle. With this application, we target a research scenario where a visualization should support the qualitative evaluation of user sessions. We study three sessions of the example, each consisting of a different pair of participants and two consecutive scenes. The researchers needed to understand how users communicate while collaborating and compare users based on their actions. Hence, we incorporate an entity timeline. The matrix layout allows to represent each entity in a separate row. We use color of the glyphs to identify different types of events. Interactions between two entities are represented through a vertical line. Considering speech as separate event, histograms and waveform visualizations show the event density fields below the matrix. Lastly, a scene view shows recording of the virtual scene. We can immediately observe that scenes in session 1 were longest, while scenes in session 3 were shortest in duration. The waveform visualization at the bottom indicate that verbal exchange was minimal in the short scenes. It indicates that participants of the session adopted an effective strategy to collaborate and complete the task. Investigating the shortest duration session further, we find that there is a pattern in the interaction of entities. First, the collaborator in location 1 starts to interact three times with three different objects in location 2, indicated by the first three consecutive green dots and short vertical lines. Afterwards, the collaborator in location 2 does the same. This collaboration pattern seems to require less verbal exchange and takes less time to complete the task. On the other hand, in session 1, we see a different pattern of collaboration. Here, players take turn to place tiles in remote locations. In the middle of the session, we see two consecutive interactions with the same entities. It appears that a participant made a mistake that was highlighted by the collaborator and was then corrected. This observation was confirmed after watching the playback of the scene. Hence, through this application example, we showed how to use a combination of visualization categories from the design space and construct a visualization technique specifically for a mixed reality application. The visualization helped the researchers in understanding collaboration behavior of users through their actions. We consider our work to be only a first step in the direction of visually analyzing user sessions of virtual and mixed reality environments. We identified three challenges that require further research for effectively visualizing such sessions. In mixed reality environments, some entities have dual representations, one in virtuality and one in reality. Some use cases might require developers and researchers to study divergences and occasional misalignment of the two representations, because these can be critical obstacles for the perceived immersion. Hence, novel visualizations must be developed for visualizing spatiotemporal data of such dual representations. Recordings of virtual and mixed reality sessions involve diverse data streams such as trajectories, events, video, and audio. The complexity rises with movement in a 3D environment, with a virtual and real scene blended over and with multi-user scenarios. Interactions in mixed reality are highly dynamic and several lines of action might run in parallel. The traditional visualizations for such diverse data and interactions are not enough. Analyzing individual user sessions might provide some insight, but is limited. Only after considering several user sessions could reveal typical usage strategies, common obstacles, and relevant misalignment. Visual comparison and aggregation of user sessions need to be supported. For comparatively evaluating the strategies employed by different users, 
we need to develop meaningful abstractions that can be reliably detected in an automatic or semi-automatic process. To conclude, we proposed a design and application space consisting of seven categories. We discussed two application scenarios where these categories can be used to visualize sessions of virtual and mixed reality environments. Through one application example, we showed how the categories can be combined and tailored for a specific remote collaboration mixed reality application. For more details and another application example, please refer to the paper. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks for having you here today. Um, I have some questions. I guess some of them were already addressed by you um, and we still have to wait for Discord to update. Um, you talked about your scenario where you used a remote uh, collaborative uh, scenario, yes? Mm -hmm. And um, what I was considering, if you have a multi-user scenario, uh, in a single room, for example, yeah, there are some mixed reality uh, escape room scenarios where you have multiple users in one room. Do you consider this to be too much data in the end to analyze everything? Uh, thanks, thanks, Andre, for the question. I'm happy to be here. That's a good question, actually. So that's one of the things which we realized. And yes, definitely, uh, it is a lot of data. Uh, that's why in our future challenges, we have also mentioned that there is a diverse stream of data. And as you said, with multiple users, the data gets large. But at the end, um, whatever the data, uh, how, however large the data is, by abstracting, you can focus on the specific, uh, specific aspects of the data. And that's the key. That's the key in these categories and the way to use them. It highly depends on the analysis task, what you want to focus on. So it means that you don't want to look at the entire data at once. So that's how you can abstract stuff and then focus on specific aspects. Ah, okay. Yeah, this, this was also one of my second question. You know, the little part you already mentioned. You mentioned a lot of this in your future or your, your challenges, what you call it. Um, you said you have to generate abstractions for multiple sessions, for example. Yeah? You are, what you presented was always just a single session, if I if I understood it correctly, yeah? You had uh, multiple uh, single sessions that were presented. Yeah, there were three sessions. Um, yeah. Each session consisted of two scenes, yeah. Yeah, and uh, do you have any idea how to combine these results and get more insight into that? This is, I guess, something you will do in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. That's, again, a great question. So yeah. uh, we had actually around 16 uh, sessions with 16 different pairs of participants, uh, but that was for a different research. Uh, but uh, this size of participant study is usual in HCI research. So, yes, that's very typical to you, researchers want to know what's the qualitatively the behavior of participants how they performed an interaction, how they uh, went or walked in a scene. And to do that, they need to look at all the sessions um, together as well as individually. So we need uh, these interaction capabilities in the interface where we can uh, look at the individual scenes, then we can um, uh, sort of aggregate them and then look at them together. Okay, cool. Um, I'm looking at the Discord, but there's nothing happening right now. Uh, Okay, I guess then we will continue. Actually, yeah, the time is running. Uh, I thank you. It's really interesting, especially for me and my research. So I'm looking forward for your next submission. And so we will continue with our next speaker. Uh, it's Florian Fries from the University of Stuttgart. Hey. Can you see me? Yeah, I can see and you. Hey, perfect. Okay. Then I will stop sharing the screen. Okay. So that should work now yeah, as work. well. Yeah. Perfect. OK, um, so thank you for the introduction. And I will talk about real-time high-resolution visualization.
so our goal was we have two um, sites, two large displays, um, and we wanted to create a system that allows to share the full content, full resolution display content between those two um, power walls. In addition to bidirectional audio and video, so high resolution video, for example, 4K, um, the system should also be able to be used for telepresence um, scenarios like remote talks or other teleconference scenarios and also for collaboration between the two sites. So you could have an application running and you can share the content with other sites. You can also share additional video and audio and then talk about um, what you see in, in the data and analyze it. So the um, book screen resolution display sharing could be application agnostic. Um, we faced a couple of challenges. Um, firstly, and I think most importantly, um, those large high resolution displays or power walls are often unique hardware setup and uh, research prototypes or research projects. As you can see at the bottom, those are the two sites we developed our system originally for. Um, so the software that runs in those systems is specifically tailored towards the hardware to make use of the often complex compute hardware like GPU clusters um, to run optimally on, on the display and to have a high frame rate. Um, so this was the first challenge. Um, and the other, as I already mentioned, um, it's often complex hardware, so you have to create a system that actually works um, with multiple different power walls. Um, there has already been work done on this. So specifically pixel streaming has been explored previously. Um, but in recent years, the research moved away from pixel streaming as a way of sharing content and collaboration settings. And it moved, the research moved more towards browser-centric implementations, which of course allowed these systems to run on any device, be it a smartphone or a large high resolution display. So it just works. Um, but they often lack the performance to actually share the full screen content at interactive frame rates. So we revisited pixel streaming um, because of two factors. Firstly, the low latency hardware video and encoder and decoders are becoming more and more available. So they're basically in every new GPU. Um, and each of these large displays has one property, namely they have a large frame buffer, which might be distributed across multiple display nodes, but still it's one frame buffer and it's used to display colored pixels. So pixel streaming, in our opinion, is a valid solution for sharing this content. Um, so we use pixel streaming in our system for everything. Um, for the full screen content, for the 4K bidirectional video, and also for additional um, devices like sharing the content of laptops in order to give the, the possibility of having a talk in front of the power wall, just like you would have in the usual seminar room. Um, these hardware encoders also offer us a very low latency and interactive frame rate, so we can capture 60 FPS. Um, and we also had the challenge that we had to create a system that works on these different hardware setups. So we created a system that is configurable to a certain system with a descriptive XML file. So I'll give you a short overview. So this is very complex and it's basically every major component that our system can perform on a single node. Um, but today we are only going to focus on the screen sharing part. So we have screen capturing, encoding, decoding, and then the display again. And this is the four major points I was talking about. Video, the 4K video path is basically similar. It uses the same path like encoding and decoding, but the source for the images is a different one. So firstly, we're gonna start with the screen capturing. The idea here was to acquire the last rendered frame um, for this, we use the desktop duplication API by Microsoft, um, specialist for, for Windows. Um, so what it does, it basically offers us the last rendered frame, so a complete rendered frame on the display node as a DXPI surface. So it's a 2D texture. Um, 
which has the advantage that it remains on the GPU um, and can then be passed on to the encoder. Um, this is also in order to decrease latency. And I will come back to that later. Um, the only downside is it uses a different color format um, than what the encoder expects. Um, so we have to perform a color format conversion. Um, we do this on the compute shader, um, which also takes care of the rotation since the desktop duplication API handles rotations differently. And you can see that on the right. Um, so if you have your image in portrait mode, um, then the output is rotated um, instead of you have it in, in landscape. But the resolution is still the same, so they don't rotate the texture, but the content, um, which needs to be fixed, of course, if you have different um, setups. And we also can perform downscaling or dividing the image into separate tiles if this is requested. Um, this can be done in order to um, fulfill the maximum resolution requirements of the encoder. And something to note, we only synchronize the first captured frame across all display nodes. After that, the, each display node captures the last rendered frame and then encodes and transmits it. Um, so we had to have a fluent um, stream, a fluid video stream. So now to the other part, namely the encoding, decoding, and then the display. For this, we use NVIDIA's hardware-based encoder, video encoder, and decoder. Um, they have the advantage that it's a separate chip on the GPU, which is then separated from other workloads like compute and graphics. So we don't, we don't have any impact um, if we run a compute or a graphic workload. It doesn't impact the encoding. It runs separately. Um, we have two APIs provided by NVIDIA, NVENC and NVDEC. NVENC is for encoding and NVDEC is for decoding. Um, we have chosen this because they offer us a interoperability with Direct3D. As I mentioned earlier, we are getting DXGI surfaces, so they stay on the GPU. Um, and they can be directly used as input for the encoder or directly used as output for the decoder, which saves us additional, additional copy operations again, reducing latency, and this was kind of our main focus. Um, the other advantage is that both uh, the encoding and decoding are asynchronous. So it's more of fire and forget operation, allowing you to capture at high frame rates because the thread that offers the frames for, for the input for the encoding can just encode the frame and then already get the next one. Um, the same is true for the decoding. Um, in case we the encoder and decoder cannot keep up, we we'll start dropping frames, um, but that doesn't impact the, the capture rate. So the capture rate is independent from the encoding and display the same with decoding. Um, then there's a one-to-one -one relationship. So for every encoder, we need a decoder. Um, this does not mean that there is a one-to-one -one relationship in encoded chips directly. So one encoder, uh, decoded chip can decode multiple streams, but we need one encoder for each stream, the same as we need a decoder. There are also a um, couple of challenges, as I already mentioned earlier. Um, the resolution is limited. That depends on the hardware. So for the Maxwell GPUs, uh, Quattro GPUs that we're using, the maximum resolution is 4K by 4K. Um, so if a frame is bigger, we need to either downscale or file it into separate parts. If we downscale, we lose quality. Um, in case we want to avoid that, we can divide that into separate tiles and encode each tile as a separate video stream. Um, this can be done since NVENC uh, allows us to open multiple session, and each session is then um, used to encode a video stream. And the session is important because it stores the information for the interframes. Um, so the interframe can only be computed if there's a keyframe before. Um, and then it stores the information and produces interframe until the next keyframe is produced. Um, but the number of parallel NVENC sessions, the maximum is limited. Um, so it's two for non-quattro cards, it includes everything RTX, PTX, and Titans. Um, 
we can go above the limit. So we can force one session to encode, for example, two streams. But then we are only getting keyframes because we cannot produce intro frames because of the information stored um, in the session is only for one theme. So this breaks down. Um, so in this case, we get a higher encoding latency because you have to encode two streams in parallel and the bandwidth also, the required bandwidth also goes up. This is not so much a problem for Cockroach cards where the number of sessions is unlimited. So in theory, you could go as high as you want. Um, again, at some point, you're going to hit a performance limit. Um, we used a couple of encoder settings. Um, you can see the impact on, on the right. Um, so first, we used H.264 for encoding. Um, then we used the low latency preset, again, to get the lowest latency possible. Um, then we used constant quality, since we wanted to fix the quality for the screen sharing. Um, in theory, our configuration allows us to change all of these settings for each video stream um, individually. And constant quality results in an unlimited bitrate, so we cannot say how much bandwidth is required because the encoder encodes with the quality we set. And we used three presets, low, medium, and high. Um, with the quality settings, so low is a relatively low setting, medium is compromised between quality and required bandwidth, and high is kind of lossless um, because it still looks not that much different from, from the original frame. Decoding um, and then the display is kind of similar, so decoding works in basically the same way as the encoder. Um, it has a certain feature that it may delay the coding of a frame in order to maintain frame rates. Um, so if we're getting too many frames at once, the decoding of each frame is delayed in order to get the frame rate correctly. And decoded frames are queued for display. Um, in order to ensure that the whole um, display, so the overall display, each of the nodes displays the same frame, we offer two modes. The preferred mode uses QuattroSync by NVIDIA, um, which ensures that all the GPUs um, perform the buffer switch at the exact same time, and the fallback way is via MPI. Okay, now on to the results. Um, so for this, we evaluated our system with only our large high-resolution display, which is a stereotype display. So we have two channels, left and right. Um, each uh, channel has a resolution of 10,800 times 4,069. Um, and what we did, we used the right stereo channel to compute and display a um, molecular simulation. Um, those display nodes also captured um, and encoded the frames um, and then distributed them with the high-speed interconnect to a streaming node which then transmitted the encoded frames over a local area 10 gigabit network to the client side, um, to the streaming node. And from there, the frames got distributed and um, decoded and displayed. The setup allowed us for visual uh, inspection of the latency because you could just see how far the left channel is behind the right one. And we also had a clean um, laboratory um, for the latency measurements because nothing would influence um, our network. And now on to the results. Um, let's go over them a bit quicker. Um, encoding has the highest impact, as you can see. This is mostly due to the keyframes, which for the highest setting take up to 22 milliseconds. Um, for the others, it's about 12 milliseconds, so 60 FPS is still continuously possible with the high setting. We are getting a bit below, but only for keyframes. Uh, Intra frames are between six and seven milliseconds. And on the decoding side, there's only one high impact, and that is the mapping for the decoded frame, which is an NVDEC operation, which takes more than five milliseconds. Um, so, as you can see, the overall worst case latency is about 40 milliseconds, making it extremely viable. And the required Bandwidth for the method throughput can be seen here. So we have the low quality basically using nothing. It's about 80 megabits maximum. The medium setting about 500. And the high setting goes up to 2 gigabits. 
uh, to conclude my talk. Um, we have seen that pixel streaming is a practical solution for sharing content for high resolution displays. Um, although we require the use of low latency and modern hardware encoding and decoding chips in order to do this, we can live with gigabit ethernet connection which provides sufficient bandwidth if we choose the right setting for the whole um, setup. So our presented solution enables application agnostic content streaming um, as we wanted to do um, by using the distributed frame buffer for pixel streaming. And in addition, we also have the possibility to do real-time video conferences and multi-site talks. And in the future, we want to use WebRTC for spectators. We have a RTSP stream for them, but they cannot interact with us. And we also want to make sure that these scenarios can be changed on the fly because for now they are kind of static. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now. Okay, one person is already typing, but I guess I can start for now. Um, yeah. You said you are using Quadro cards from NVIDIA, right? Yeah. Um, and you are using the NVENC encoder. So I. I don't know this. Um, are there differences between different versions of the NVIDIA encoder and are they intercompatible? Um, so there are differences, but you can basically use um, any NVIDIA GPU. So the only thing that changes between generations is the capability. So the performance increases, the resolution increases. Um, with the newer cards, you can do 8K, um, which we cannot do with ours. So we have in the paper, there's also a short discussion of an additional 8K scenario and also about tiling, um, which we had to do um, in order to stream at that resolution. Okay, so uh, we will continue with one question from the Discord. Um, if you had to wish, what piece of hardware would you like to have changed in your system? Mm, that's a different, difficult question. Um, so for now, um, obviously we would have new GPUs because that would make um, encoding easier and probably faster. Yeah. Um, since we cannot do 8K, that would be probably the next um, step up. Okay. Um, and something I want to ask, um, can your system accept multiple streams with different applications from different sources? I guess you're already on the limit of your ethernet connection to some. Um, in, in theory, we can. So um, in theory, we could stream from two power walls to one. Um, the thing is, as you already mentioned, the limited um, bandwidth could be a problem. Um, and you, you can choose to reduce the required bandwidth by decreasing the settings. Um, and then there are also other possibilities um, to adapt the, the bandwidth because this is basically the major problem. Um, the capturing and display decoding is, is still fine, but the problem is kind of abandoned. So this is um, something we still have to look at and how to reduce the bandwidth um, in order to allow the scenarios in, in the real world. Okay, so I guess we have time for one more question. And there was somebody typing, but he stopped. Uh, then there's something I want to ask. Um, I read it in your paper that you um, are looking into foveated rendering for the streaming part? Uh, um, so it was um, the idea, and I published that at, at LDF um, this year, um, is foveated encoding. So um, reduce the quality settings everywhere. So use the worst quality settings possible, and then only increase for parts of people are actually looking at. Um, so this saves quite a lot of bandwidth. Um, and if you're interested, I have a talk at LDF about this. Um, so yeah, we are looking into ways on how to reduce the, the bandwidth for, for these kind of scenarios. Okay, I guess now we have to continue with our next speaker. Thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, so our next and last speaker for this session uh, is Stefan Lengauer from the University of Graz. Hey, I can see you. I can't hear you right now. Perfect. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Okay, great. Perfect. Uh, so have fun with your talk. We will speak afterwards. Okay, so first of all, hello everyone. And thank you very much for the introduction. And also thank you very much for having me here. 
My name is uh, Stefan Lengauer and I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Computer Graphics and Knowledge Visualization at Graz Technical University, where I'm working on search and visual exploration methods for cultural heritage objects. <clears throat> uh, today I'll present to you our latest research paper titled Visual Exploration of Cultural Heritage uh, Collections with Linked Spatial Temporal Shape and Metadata Views which was created in collaboration with archaeologists from the Institute of Classics at Graz University. The analysis of cultural heritage objects in terms of their historical context is of fundamental importance for archaeological research. To this end, finding and understanding relations between objects regarding traits of different inherit and derived modalities like fine spots, dating, shape or painting is a crucial prerequisite for gaining new insights. And this presses the need for visualization systems which allow an expert user to analyze and explore the relations between classes and different modalities within a large object volume. We built a system which allows exactly that together with domain researchers from the field of archaeology who are familiar with the domain specific requirements and challenges. And the basic idea of our approach is to use a multiple view system, one view per trade modality, which displays the same set of interlinked CH objects in each of the views. But first of all, let's shed some light on what's been done before. There is a lot of work where object relations are presented via network visualizations, also in the CH domain, as you can see here by the works of uh, Van der Martin et al. for vessel shape similarity, or by Bogatz et al. who used the concept to display similarities across Mayan glyphs. Uh, but as mentioned, we want to coherently visualize not just one modality, but multiple, multiple at the same time of a data set. And there are also example, example concepts which combine uh, temporal information with non-categorical object relations like the topographic attribute maps approach by Prana et al, where a network visualization is combined with an underlying height field encoding the temporal information. Or alternatively, Windhoek et al. Uh, display this temporal information in the third spatial dimension of a three-dimensional polycube system. However, uh, after initial experiments with prototypes, we decided for a multi-view system, meaning that we do not incorporate different modalities into one integrated visualization, but into multiple views. Uh, more specifically, one per modality, and all depicting the same set of objects which are internally linked. This allows on the one hand to analyze each of our supported modalities individually, but also to draw conclusions regarding cross-modal cluster correlations of arbitrary combinations of modalities by means of an interactive interview highlighting and linking tool. Also the multi-view approach has the advantage that it can be easily extended with additional views while aggregation and specification algorithms allow for a dynamic degree of visual granularity from a broad overview down to a close-up. At the current state, our system, which we call the Linked Views Visual Exploration System, or in short, ELVIS, is uh, comprised of views for fine spot, date, and shape modalities. This initial selection has been made together with archaeologists from the field of ancient Greek pottery, which is also the kind of uh, domain data we use for our initial tests and evaluations. Together, we also established a set of domain relevant tasks, which are of a single modal as well as, as, well as a cross modal type. And our resulting views and overall system was tailored to address these very tasks. So with that being said, let's look at the individual views in more detail. Uh, here you can see our view for fine spot information. The bedrock for this view is a geographic map on which we place object previews at the respective locations. And as you can see, there are obvious issues we face when naively placing previews on the map, even for this rather small data set. Obviously, we have a huge number of objects crowded in a few archaeologically relevant sites, while large areas of the map remain untouched. So a remedy for this is to aggregate objects by the common find place into so-called multi-object previews, like this, with a number indicating the number of aggregated objects. Um, 
yeah, but even though we have a much smaller number of previews, there are still some overlapping each other while there is sufficient space around them. And to counteract this drawback, we make use of, uh, uh, let's say, the efficiency of uh, defined place information in our data, which is that a uh, find place cannot be pinpointed to one exact location, but to other two areas of varying sizes, which can also be intersecting or even be contained within one another, as you can see by the blue rectangles. So consequently, we allow the previews to place themselves at an arbitrary position within their designated areas such that they are not intersecting. And yeah, we do so by means of a simple collision-driven force simulation resulting in a layout as it can be seen now. An additional challenge of our data at hand is that a lot of objects are missing fine spot information altogether. Uh, still, they do appear in the other views and they might be of relevance. So we cope for them with an aggregated preview, uh, which we place at a fixed location at the upper right corner of the map, which is uh, symbolized with a question mark. Uh, for displaying temporal information, we decided for timeline visualization, which is probably the most common approach. However, we also incorporate uncertainty of uh, dating as well as object quantities into this view. More specifically, we symbolize object as blocks aggregated by common date within a grid with the uh, X dimension encoding the time naturally and the Y dimension encoding the object quantity. Note that the blocks are of different width for the dating information for CH objects is given as uh, possibly half open intervals with varying lengths. And for an appropriate placement of blocks in Y direction, we again apply a force layout, which makes sure that blocks are not overlapping while also being vertically centered. And again, we have objects which do not have this kind of uh, dating information and those are accumulated in a dedicated block to the left of the timeline. And our third view uh, is a network visualization of shape similarities. Here we apply a forced link layout where the link force is relative to a similarity measure we obtain from a shape-based feature descriptor operating on our object's silhouettes. Uh, which in turn we obtained from a foreground background segmentation of object depictions. And more specifically, we use the shape contour descriptor by Atala and C. Additional repulsion forces between all the knots uh, make sure that similar objects group together due to the links visible as connecting blue lines, while dissimilar objects are actively pushed apart. In theory, we would have links forces between all objects because we can quantify the similarity between any object pair, which would uh, completely overconstrain the force layout, as you can see from this result. So we apply a variation of the specification algorithm presented by Satellure et al., which we adapted for fully connected weighted graphs. This allows us to get rid of uh, weak intra-cluster links while still preserving the general structure, as you can see in the picture, uh, similar objects are joined together in a cluster while links between clusters are almost non-existent or at least rare. Yeah, still for huge data sets, this proved to be too clumsy due to the vast number of knots. So uh, we applied an iterative pairs aggregation of the knots connected to the currently strongest link until a, a predefined degree of visual granularity was reached. In order to preserve the information which shapes are present in an aggregation, we developed a custom-made cliff for aggregated previews, which display the mean silhouette of all the substituted objects together with a color coding indicating the local variance of a silhouette of a silhouette section. As you can see in this preview right here. Of course, an aggregation can also be undone based on user interaction in order to allow exploration at different degrees of visual granularity. To this end, we 
record the set of objects uh, substituted by an aggregation and apply a recursive balloon approach for the reverse action, meaning that an aggregated knot can be expanded to a balloon containing all substituted objects. And such a balloon can contain aggregations as well if the number of the contained objects is large enough. The expansion action can be performed recursively until there is no more aggregation present in any of the displayed balloons. So that about sums up our various views, yet the strengths of the Elvis is how the views interact. Our system prototype constitutes a browser application where each view is impl implemented as a draggable and resizable panel so that the user can determine an arrangement fitting his or her requirements. Object relations across views are revealed through highlighting, meaning that the same highlighted selection of objects uh, simultaneously changes their visual appearance in all of the views. We visualize a highlight with a red ring around the preview and in the timeline view by changing the color to, of a block. Um, note that an aggregation can also belong only partially to the current selection. In that case, the red circle becomes an arc with an arc length relative to the portion of the selection. And additionally, we draw alluvial flow links across the views with the link strength corresponding to the number of shared highlights. Uh, if a highlight is highlighted preview is outside the currently displayed section, its presence is indicated with a landmark at the border of the respective view. Uh, there are two different ways a selection for a highlight can be made. Firstly, a lasso tool for the user which allows him or her to select a group of objects in one of the views, as you can see in this clip. And secondly, through a pre-calculated selection of the, so to say, most significant links based on an intra-view similarity of clusters. For more information on the applied metric, I have to refer to the paper. But nonetheless, here you can see the outcome for that calculation for uh, bit larger data set with more than 300 bases with the most significant links uh, displayed according to our metric and their significance encoded into the highlight transparency. The highlighted objects you can see here belong to two groups well known to the archaeologic community and are referred to by Turing Cups and Nolani and Force to their characteristic shape and fine place. Even though these relations are no new discoveries, they show that our system is capable of automatically detecting such domain relevant connections. Uh, although we did no, did no extensive usability tests, our system was used by domain experts who thought of possible scenarios to test the application. And here you can see one such scenario where an expert user selected a group of phases known as round or in the shape viewer in order to see their distribution of the timeline on the left-hand side. And in a second step, he selected the same region of the timeline in order to see which uh, other objects belong to this period in time. Finally, let me make some remarks regarding the limitations and scalability of our approach. Due to the modularity of our architecture, our existing views can be readily extended or adapted for other trade modalities. The map viewer, for example, is not only suitable for fine spot information, but can be easily used to display any geographic data. And the same holds for the network visualization, which can be used for any non-categorical information where the similarity between objects can be an ambiguously described means of a distance function. Hence, it's part of our future work to extend the set of our supported modalities. Yeah, and regarding the intra view highlighting, we found that the system becomes clumsy, clumsy and slow if too many highlights are present at the same time. And to mitigate this issue, we want to look, in, look into methods for link bundling as well as optimal routing. So to sum it up, we present an interactive and integrated expert system with custom-made views and tools for exploration and analysis. And our first results and evaluation with the main experts have underlined the potential of our approach 
And we think that with a much larger and more heterogeneous data set, we might be capable of detecting and displaying yet unknown object relations. Yeah, with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention and conclude my talk. And questions are welcome, of course. OK, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, we will wait for some questions. Uh, there was one question in my mind, but I guess you already addressed this. Uh, in your link views with multiple views that you had, mm -hmm. you already said um, that it gets clumsy when you have too many objects. Did you if consider, there are too many highlights. Yeah, yeah, too many highlights. Did you consider another additional view for the aggregation of multiple link views or another solution? Not yet, but it's actually quite an intriguing idea. <laughs> and it's something we could absolutely look into in our future work. Okay, good to know. <laughs> now you have an idea. <laughs> um, uh, okay, somebody's clapping, but there are no questions unless clapping. Um, or is there something that's typing? Hmm. Okay, give them another minute, else uh, I can consider. There was something else. Um, you already said you were working with some field experts on this pottery uh, mm -hmm. data set here. And you were saying that if you have even larger data sets, you could find new um, informations of interlinked modalities of your data set. Isn't this even bringing more problems with your current problem that you have too much data by too many highlighted objects? Yeah, I mean, the views are um, working for a, a larger data set. Um, the highlighting tool is still a bit uh, cumbersome if too many highlights are present. But it's something we want to Actually, this tool enhance. is really cool. Also, I would say it's, it's really, I guess the, the experts will love it, as you also already said. But large data is always a problem, I guess, for everyone. It still is, yeah. We have to look into also, it's uh, still a bit of a performance issue if there's too many objects present. And yeah, there is uh, some developing work we need to do in order to display and interactively work with a huge data set as, is, as it is necessary for the main experts. Hmm. Okay, when there's no more question coming, I guess we will finish up. Okay, thank you again. I guess thank you very much. Free. Um, thank you to all our presenters, all three of them. And I guess we finish up this session for today. Um, the keynote, I guess, will start in half an hour, if I remember correctly. Yes. So feel free to uh, visit the keynote.